out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer and brother, Joel, here with me as well. And today we have a very dark case for you about a just absolutely insane individual by the name of Marcus Wesson. And he's a name that I did not even know about until I started digging into, you know, some of the crazy freaks out there in the yeah. world. And until man, you told me about him, I had no idea who this was. I, and I don't think anybody really knows about him. I mean, there's not even that much information about him online or even on YouTube. I mean, this guy is just absolutely bizarre. And the story is just so dark and sinister. It will really, really fuck you up. Because this guy is a lot like David Koresh and has got a whole family cult that really does not end well. And just to give you a little uh, sneak peek into what we're going to be talking about, basically, Marcus Wesson believed he was Jesus and he also believed Jesus was a vampire. Wow. So you already know from that that yeah. this is just going to get really, really weird. And in Christian terms, he believes he's the son of God. That's like a huge claim to have. Right. Already <laughs> some similarities there with yeah. David Koresh. And, you know, he actually looked up to David Koresh quite a bit and Charles Manson. So this is another tragic story of a family cult, which we're going to be diving into today. But before we get into everything, I wanted to let everybody know that we're running a 15% off sale on our merchandise website right now, mileharmerch.com. We're trying to get rid of the remaining items that we have. And once we do, we are not restocking these. So if you want some merch, it's actually 15% off right now. So get it while it lasts. Also, this episode is brought to you by Purple, Babel, and Bartleby. And before we get into today's episode, I wanted to remind everybody that another way you can support the show in addition to merch and supporting our sponsors is by going to Apple Podcasts and making sure you're subscribed to the show. It really does help us out. And in the world of podcasting, Apple Podcasts and Spotify are still like the standard, you know, mm -hmm. for, for performance and things like that. So if you're not subscribed to us on Apple Podcasts or following us on Spotify yet, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Pause this episode. Go do right. that right now. It'd really help us out. Also, make sure you're following us on social media. At uh, Lights Out Cast. That's right. Instagram, Twitter. And follow us, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're cool. We are. We, sort of. We, we, we post some cool stuff. So, I think everyone could, would like. Yeah, exactly. So I'm at Malhar Josh. He's at Malhar Joel, of course. Yeah, I took it from him. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you you followed a suit with the handle. but Yeah, but yeah. We're, we're brothers, you know. It's so. okay. It's okay. Yeah. We, we were allowed to do that. So. <laughs> but yeah, let's uh, go ahead and get into this absolutely crazy and disturbing world of Marcus Wesson. So Marcus Wesson was born on August 22nd, 1946 in Kansas. And he was the oldest of four children to the parents of Benjamin and Carrie Wesson. And growing up, he was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church. His mother, Carrie, was described as a religious fanatic who led daily prayer sessions and Bible studies that would last for hours at a time. And they took this so seriously that if the kids acted out, if Marcus acted out, they would proceed to whip them with an electrical cord. So right there, I mean, in so many of these cases, clearly there's some type of, of trauma that's happening at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And one of those forms of trauma that people undergo and, and, you know, to some extent, Joel and I even feel like we underwent some trauma when it comes to spirituality. There's actually something known as spiritual trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, I, I think when parents punish their children and make religion, yeah, you know, that type of, of thing, it, not only sheds a negative light on it for right. you and doesn't make you want to partake in it. No, no. It definitely gives you a negative image, which which mm. is kind of defeating the whole purpose of exactly. religion, really, at that point. Yeah, because it was so forced upon you and I ever since I can remember as a young child and, you know, had had to abide by all those those rules that came with it. If not, there, we were punished. There was punished. We, and, and we weren't whipped with no, electrical cords, no. thank God. But yeah. 
you know, we were grounded in, in other ways. Yeah. So different forms of punishment. But it's like, you know, both of you and I can relate on that level of, you know, there is such a thing as spiritual trauma and and there's physical trauma here in the case of Marcus Wesson because he was whipped with an electrical cord. But I think one of the biggest problems with religion is when it's forced on another person. Exactly. Nobody should be forced to believe anything. You're Mm -mm. we're all entitled as human beings to believe what we want to. Right. That's like our right, just human rights. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I believe, at least. So on top of, you know, having a fanatical religious mother, his father was an abusive alcoholic and just really didn't have a steady job for most of his life. And on top of that, he physically and sexually abused his children. And his father, Benjamin, actually had a long term sexual affair with his male cousin, and he ended up abandoning his family for this incestuous relationship when Marcus was just a young boy. So that right there is gonna definitely have an effect on Marcus for sure. And he was gone for a whole decade before returning to the family, acting like nothing ever happened. That's just crazy to think about. Yeah, it is. I mean, your dad does all this shit to you then takes off for 10 years to only return and be like, nothing happened. Hey guys, what did I miss? Right. And you're like, dude, you've just been gone for 10 years. And, and I mean, at this point, I'm sure he was like, fuck this guy. Like, uh-huh. you know, I don't want even want him in my life. And for the worst reason, incest, right? Jesus. And then this, this story deals a lot with incest. So just prepare yourself for uh-huh. that. But the family ended up relocating to California in the early 1960s. And Marcus ended up going to Fremont Junior High School. And classmates teased him for coming to school every day wearing dress pants a jacket and a tie while the other students were dressed casually with jeans and t-shirts. So just another control tactic by his parents. And Marcus just kind of took that, that bullying. He never really picked fights with any other kids, even though this had a severe effect on him. And despite being bullying throughout his whole adolescence, Marcus never drank. He never smoked or did drugs. I mean, clearly his mom's religious ideas had an effect on him. Marcus actually wore a military style haircut, tried very hard in school. He even sang in the choir and was obsessed with trains. He absolutely loved to watch freight trains and he often played with model trains growing up. A kid named Kenny Brownfield who lived down the street from Marcus and they sometimes walked home from school together. And he was only inside Marcus's home a couple times. And all he remembered was that Marcus had a lot of electric trains. And when he was a small child, Marcus's favorite game was pretending he was a preacher as he loved to be the center of attention. Larry Morgan, who was Marcus's cousin, was also a preacher and he lived with the family on and off throughout the 1960s until he ended up being drafted in 1970. Larry remembers Marcus though as a friendly young man, but he never wanted to go out and he never wanted to drink or smoke. He preferred to just stay home and play with his trains. As far as Marcus's intelligence goes, he was average to say the least, but he was very eccentric. He had a wide vocabulary and liked to use overly descriptive words in everyday conversations and in his pretend sermons. So he liked to do, you know, kind of play, you know, people play house or play different pretend games. Mm -hmm. And Marcus liked to pretend he was a preacher giving sermons. So he, he realized that, you know, through this, he would have sort of a way of influencing those around him. When it came time for Marcus to graduate high school, he ended up not having enough credits, but the school let him participate in graduation with the rest of his class, even though he never got a diploma. After not graduating high school, he joined the army in 1966, where he trained as a medical corpsman for 10 weeks in Houston, and then he went on to work as an ambulance driver and orderly in Europe. Eventually, though, in 1968, only two years later, he left the military with an honorable discharge and moved to San Jose, California. Once he got to San Jose, he ended up meeting a woman named Rosemary Maderina. And she was actually a married woman who was 13 years older than him. And she already had eight kids. Rosemary had actually divorced her husband, who she claimed was abusive. And her and Marcus decided to start a relationship and moved in together. Rosemary had a house in the lower middle class area of East San Jose. And for a while, they lived together, and I guess they lived happily together 
And neighbors remember Marcus as, you know, a friendly guy who spent a lot of time with Rosemary's kids. And in 1971, Rosemary gave birth to Marcus's first child, a son named Adair. And at some point, Rosemary's adult daughter, also named Rosemary, left her seven children with her mother. She was struggling with drug addiction and told her mother she had to take care of them. So there were now 16 kids in their household. And instead of focusing on his new baby, Marcus started spending more time with Rosemary's eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. A few years later, Elizabeth was now 12 years old. Marcus had started molesting her and rosemary didn't object to this new relationship what like which is fucking insane are you fucking kidding me as a parent i don't know how you stop don't stop this immediately yeah. good god but she was okay with it and just asked that marcus wait until elizabeth was 15 so that she was of the legal age to consent to marry which is just wild to even think about oh yeah and Marcus was very happy about this, so he showered Elizabeth with lots of attention. And he ended up telling her at age 15, I mean, he's quite a bit older than her at this point, he's in his mid to late 20s, but he's starting to groom her and tell her the Lord had chosen her to be his wife and that she belonged to him. And as, I mean, that as a young, impressionable kid, uh huh, that's going to have an effect on you. Definitely. That's so manipulative. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I mean, if, if you haven't already figured out, he's got all the characteristics of a master manipulator. Oh, yeah. And he's already starting to use those skills on those around him, including Rosemary. And now he's starting to manipulate young Elizabeth. And it makes me wonder, like, at what point was Rosemary OK with that? Was it like right when he brought it up or did he have some serious convincing to get her to that point of understanding his sick mind on, on what he wanted. I don't know. Like we, we don't know Rosemary, but yeah, uh, I think, I think crazy. probably it was an overtime thing. I mean, I can't imagine most people would probably be like, what the, yeah. what are you talking like about? Like a straight yes to that idea. That's crazy. I think he, I mean, he's a master manipulator as mm-hmm. you'll see. And I think he really worked her into the believing that uh, this yeah. was what God wanted to do. And whenever you start throwing that around, I think things yeah. get really dangerous really quickly. When you start using divine deities and spirituality to justify actions is when things get really dangerous. And it's also convincing to the right people, right? Yeah. Like depending on who you are, if somebody seems knowledgeable enough about God or spirituality, you might be inclined to believe them. Very good point there. So I think that's kind of what happened. But this is just absolutely sick and mind blowing. Elizabeth ended up getting pregnant when she was just 14 years old. And as soon as she got turned 15, Marcus and her got married. And mind you, Marcus is now 27 years old. Damn. Impregnating a 14 year old. Oh man, I feel so bad for her. So really, Elizabeth really never even got a chance. I mean, it no. seemed like she was literally set up in this, this type of relationship. And her mother allowed it, which is just, crazy that's like going a to z she didn't have time to figure out who she is and what she wants in life like anybody that says you can consent to this at 15 that's just crazy and i don't i don't know for sure if that that's clearly i think what the law was at the time i think so the law i think at the time in san jose was you can consent at age 15 with a parental permission Uh, so she had to get rosemary's permission and clearly rosemary said yes so what that tells me is that rosemary was already drinking the kool-aid as they say right marcus's kool-aid so he had already manipulated her he had already started to brainwash rosemary to allow her to give her young daughter away to him so on their marriage certificate marcus and elizabeth both listed their occupations as students and elizabeth ended up dropping out of school in eighth grade didn't even get to finish her education Four months after getting married, Elizabeth gave birth to Marcus's second child, Dorian. And Marcus and Elizabeth lived on one story of the house with their new baby. And Rosemary lived on the another level with her kids and Marcus's son, Adair. So this house is already insane. There's a ton of kids in it. I I can't even imagine what life was actually like for these kids in this already horribly fucked up house. 
But Marcus and Elizabeth went on to have four kids by the end of the 1970s. Dorian, Adrian, Kiani, and Sabrina. And the last kid that was born in San Jose was named Alme. Marcus eventually told Rosemary him and Elizabeth were taking their kids and moving out. And he gave her a choice to let him take the van or their son, Adair. So she gave him the keys to her van. And after only a few years later, by the time Elizabeth was 26 years old, she had five additional kids with Marcus named Donovan, Marcus Jr., Elizabeth, and Serafino. And they were all born in Santa Cruz County. Gypsy was born in Fresno County, and Donovan actually died at six months old from spinal meningitis. So this is just already getting completely out of control. And I, I really wonder about this. I mean, I don't know much about spinal meningitis, but I feel like these conditions that they were living in were probably not good at all. Uh-huh. I mean, he's already got way more kids than he can handle. And I mean, things are just getting out of uh, hand really quickly. And I feel so bad for Elizabeth. That's so many kids. Yes. Yeah, at that young of an age, already uh, popped out eight or nine kids. Uh, God, it's just crazy. Yeah. In 1986, Elizabeth's sister asked her and Marcus to take her children as well. And these nieces and nephews have been neglected and abused and were excited to go join Elizabeth and Marcus in their life. But they soon realized that this was an absolute mistake because Marcus started molesting his niece, Ruby, when she was just eight years old, just like he did with Elizabeth. And he would tell her that this was how a father shows affection to his daughter. When you're that young, you don't know any better, so you're just like confused and that's what you're being told. And he continued this pattern with all of his daughters and nieces. Once they were about eight years old, he started a ritual, which he called loving, where he molested them in their beds at night. Marcus believed he was teaching the girls about sexuality to help them become better women and please their future husbands. But the kids had almost no direct contact with the outside world. They were never taken to doctors and they didn't go to school. They were all homeschooled instead using old textbooks and flashcards. And the older kids taught the younger kids as best as they could. Sometimes the lessons they had were just drawing and coloring. And some of the girls never even learned how to read and write. So instead of like literally just remove them from society and just became his victims and just became a part of his agenda. Uh-huh. It was no longer about these kids' lives. No. He basically stole their lives from them and right. said, you're going to come live my way. And I can't imagine how scary it was for those kids because number one, they don't know what's going on. And number two, they're completely isolated and they, they, they can't compare their current experience with anyone else out there about what is to them is a normal life. So right. They're just all on the Kool-Aid, I guess. Like Brainwashed. 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 And to me, brainwashing someone like this is one of the most evil things you can do. Oh, yeah. I think taking somebody's right away to think for themselves and to experience the world for themselves is one of the most evil things you can do to somebody because you're robbing them of that right to live. Mm-hmm. And especially in this situation where you're in abusive incestuous relationship with your father i mean it's a million times worse and so marcus he started focusing rather than teaching them the things they need to know to actually live a normal life he decided to focus on their religious education where he taught them from his own handwritten version of the bible so he took all of these different concepts not only from christianity from the actual bible but he took it from fundamentalist Mormonism. He took it from a lot of different religions and the fundamentalist ones at that. And his version of Christianity included polygamy. So multiple, multiple spouses, which would make, make sense in his case. Incest was okay. And vampires. And that's where shit just gets really fucking bizarre. So he said that he was the Messiah. And that Jesus Christ was a vampire. And sometimes he would even refer to himself as a vampire god or vampire king. 
And he ended up naming himself Javam Marcus Spire, which is a combination of Jesus, Marcus, and Vampire. Oh my God. <laughs> and that was the name he went by. How fucking crazy what is that? What the fuck? And then he decided that all of his kids and his family would refer to him as Master or Lord. So literally at this point, he's decided that, you know what? I'm going to create my own cult, essentially, is what uh-huh. it is. But it seems like everyone else is a slave. Absolutely. He's the master. And he ended up giving his daughters and nieces vampire names as well. And in his Bible, he wrote the key to immortality was drinking blood. And he believed that the only thing that was different between them and vampires was the fact that they had souls. And just like Marcus had experience when he was young, he would have very, very long Bible studies that would last hours and hours. And this is Bible studies from Marcus's Bible. So you can imagine how crazy and disgusting and disturbing these Bible studies must have been. And then on top of that, to really just put the icing on the cake, he would tell them that the reason why I'm teaching you all this is because Armageddon is about to go down. Of course. The end of the world is near. We've seen that with David Koresh. Boom. I mean, and and he's even talked about, and even in, I think, in some of his texts that have been recovered from his house, he referred to looking up to people like David Koresh. I mean, obviously, you're probably already thinking that, and there's lots of similarities there. Same with, I mean, similar with Charles Manson as well, some similarities with his ideas and thinking as well. So this was what their life consisted of. Marcus ordering them to call him master, lord, call him by his vampire name. Everybody's going around the house talking to each other, calling each other by their vampire names. And in Marcus's mind, all of these girls, all these daughters that he had were destined to be his wives. So in addition to his handwritten Bible, Marcus also wrote a manuscript about his life. And he called it, In the Night of the Light for the Dark. And he actually tried to get this published. That's that's how fucking egotistical he was. But it was rejected by Vantage Press, which was a publishing company in New York in 2002. Because the publisher was like, what the actual fuck is this? What are you sending me? Right? He probably just had a bunch of copy and paste going on from all these different sources. And just his crazy ass ideas that he just made up in his head. I mean, Mm -hmm. what source is he pulling that Jesus is a vampire? That's a good point. I've never seen anything that says Jesus was a vampire. No. Seems like something he's creating himself. Yeah. And he, and the reason why he he kind of came up with this idea is because, you know, with Christianity, a lot of Christianity is, you know, the blood of Christ is what saved us. You know, that's like how you're saved. It's like Jesus died on the cross for our sins. His blood cleanses us. Mm-hmm. So in a way, he took that whole idea and twisted it and said, you know, we're consuming the blood of Christ, so therefore we are vampires and Jesus is a vampire. Gotcha. Which is just really fucking weird. Just shows you where his head's at. Yeah. Clearly in a really weird, dark place. But sadly, his sons and daughters and nieces and nephews and these just poor kids were consistently physically abused as that's how he kept them in line, kept them brainwashed. Marcus would use baseball bats, electrical cords, or even his own fists and would just beat up the kids for the smallest things. Like literally asking him a question. If he didn't like the question you asked, he'd take a baseball bat to you. Like some of his sons would literally later on say that they would literally ask him like, can I eat this? And he would say, no, grab a baseball bat and wail on them. Just beat them over the back until they had welts that's terrible full-on welts on their bodies and then when he wasn't using the baseball bat he also had something else that was specifically for beating some of the younger kids and the girls which was a stick wrapped in duct tape and the reason he did this was because that way it wouldn't leave any obvious marks or break their bones but still i mean that's gonna fucking hurt extremely bad and once when his one month old infant jonathan was crying Marcus beat him until his legs bled. One month old infant, a tiny baby. Oh my God. And he's beating this poor kid with this stick until his legs are bleeding, which I'm like, that doesn't really fucking prevent any marks. I don't think he really cared, honestly. No. And sometimes punishments lasted for weeks. 
like getting hit 21 times per day for 30 days straight. Literally, he'd have like a punishment schedule. It was just like a part of their daily routine. He would he would come for their uh-huh. meeting and he asked them, he literally brainwashed them to the point where it was up to the kids to come and ask Marcus for their daily beating. Wow. So he so if you didn't come yeah. and ask him for your spanking is what they I think they called it. It was like their what? their daily spanking. And they'd have one in the morning, lunch, dinner type of situation. Regardless if they're good and even if they're bad, you shouldn't yeah. be getting beaten and by any means, but what the fuck? No, it's just like, part of their daily life was to be punished. Like So he's clearly getting satisfaction out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly there's Physi- physical tortures arousing to him could be Mm -hmm. could be clearly or gets him off in some way but i think for him it was just all about it's about control especially like fear 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 fear-based control i mean he's telling them that armageddon is near yeah they're scared of physical abuse i mean fear is you know one of the best ways to control people Mm -hmm. and keep people subservient to you and that's what he did and since they never stayed in one place for too long and the kids were so isolated there's no record of child and family services ever being involved with the family because that's what i'm thinking too i'm like why didn't anybody call like child protective services like clearly this is a really bad situation but yeah he was smart and he would move around and they were clearly just terrified like what Uh would happen if we did you know tell somebody on him and it seems like they were so isolated that any i'm I'm assuming there were other adults around him too who might have witnessed those things but they might have been under his power of the control that they knew if they snitched on him or something like that then they, they could probably be killed for it or something like that so yeah i mean they're clearly scared to death it's very obvious uh-huh. that even the older children and you know their teenagers are clearly able to do something if they wanted to but they didn't they were just so Goes also just so brainwashed i mean it's too, yeah. fear not of only that but i think it's also just the brain that's the only environment you know so you don't know any different so then you're not necessarily going to do anything i think that's what's the hardest about these types of situations is that we all just are like how could somebody just not like realize that this is fucked up what he's doing and go call the police even like call 911 and be like i'm being beaten i i can prove it Uh but unless you've been in an abusive relationship there's no way to possibly understand what that's like and and i think true oftentimes you you're in that situation and you're you you don't see a way out of it because the the consequences involved with with ratting somebody out that's abusing you could be far worse than exactly than actually doing that than like putting up with it so to speak i mean it's super complex you know abusive especially physically abusive relationships are extremely complex and there's so many factors that go into it that in uh, you know somebody who's never experienced that it's just so easy to be like they could have just called 911 picked up a phone and called 911 and this would have been all over but he had them completely brainwashed into thinking he was literally god uh-huh. he's literally jesus and he has this power over them and they're subservient to him it's really really dangerous and when the boys were old enough marcus encouraged them to go get jobs and move out on their own because he was only really interested in the girls and he wanted to keep them close and obviously getting the men, the older boys out of the way would make that easier for him. But he would actually force the girls to get jobs at fast food restaurants or hotels and then hand over any money they made in order to support the family. So he's literally just using them as slaves to support himself. As he believed he was the head of the household and he didn't have to work and got welfare instead. And when neighbors asked about his job, He told them that God would take care of him. And when they weren't at jobs, the girls and women worked from morning to night, caring for the younger kids, cooking and cleaning. And Marcus literally made them wait on him, wash his long, thick dreadlocks, and even scratch his armpits. He literally looked at himself like a king. That's why he called him vampire king, vampire god. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because he would have them wait on him. Like He literally thought he was like this divine being. His daughter, Kiani, viewed him as their financial advisor, and she said he could take $20 and make it seem like we had $200. So they trusted him to invest their money for them, because that's what he told them he'd do. But Marcus started having sexual relationships with the girls as they hit puberty, or sometimes even younger. And he performed marriage ceremonies with three of his nieces, Ruby, Rosa, or Rosie, 
and Safina, and two of his own daughters, Sabrina and Elizabeth. And during this marriage ceremony, they put their hands on a Bible and they would recite their vows. And he ended up giving each of them a gold wedding band and a necklace. How disgusting is this? Literally marrying your own daughters. And his legal wife, Elizabeth, which we all remember Elizabeth, poor Elizabeth, who got dragged into this by him, was so brainwashed at this point that she completely supported everything that was happening, including supporting these marriages. Because he had, he had already brainwashed her, been molesting Elizabeth since she was eight years old and married him when he was 15. So this was literally the only life that Elizabeth knew. So that would make sense for why she'd go along with all of Marcus's crazy things. And Marcus you know, knowingly doing what he's doing, didn't take any precautions to keep the girls from getting pregnant as he believed incest produces the seed of perfection of one's self. So literally he was like, I have the best genes. My family has the best genetics. And I'm just literally not even understanding what, you know, incest even is or what kinds of issues can come out of that. And instead he was just keen on making his own offspring from his own DNA in a sense, just completely fucked up. And when the girls got pregnant, he coached them to tell people that they were artificially inseminated, including his sons and nephews. His niece, Ruby remembers the molestation starting when she was around eight years old. And by the time she was 13, she was excited to marry her uncle, believing that she was one of his chosen wives. Cause that's what she's been told since she was a kid. So as a kid, you're like, yeah, that's what I want. That sounds good because that's all, you know, and that's what he's been pumping you up for. And Marcus ended up telling her, God wants man to have more than one wife and God's people are becoming extinct. We need to preserve God's children. We need to have more children for the Lord. So she soon got pregnant and had a baby boy named Aviv. And at some point she ran away, but Elizabeth found her and talked her into coming back to take care of her son. Because you can probably imagine how crazy that experience must have been for her to have a son with him oh definitely and marcus became concerned that the boys would be sexually attracted to the girls so he started separating them forbidding any contact between the two genders in the family at this point it's extremely clear that what he's literally created is a family cult i mean he's literally right i mean if you know anything about cults or you know, oh, yeah. the Branch Davidians to, you know, Charles Manson's cult. Like they create a family. Yeah. And everybody is involved with each mm -hmm. other. And Marcus got so concerned that his boys, nephews, would become sexually attracted to these other girls. So he started separating them and forbidding any contact between the two genders in this family. So he controlled every dynamic of it. And clearly he just. He wanted all of these girls to himself. Yeah. And that's to a whole new extreme comparing him to David Koresh because Koresh, he, he did polygamy and he had all of his wives and stuff, but he did allow the men, a part of the family to marry those wives, but the, those men had to be okay with Koresh. Also ha participating. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so this was like... Marcus in this case is like, no, they're all to myself. Like, yeah. And again, let's remember, this is all family. Ugh. so this is all incest there is no I, I mean with the branch davidians i mean you at least have different different families bloodlines or, yeah, and blood genetics lines. going on here but this is purely one family that's so all true having babies together it's just a really yeah. sick situation at some point marcus's son alme wanted to date elizabeth's niece by marriage so marcus wrote a 14 page proclamation called the house of elizabeth that officially ordered his sons and nephews to stay away from Elizabeth's niece and all the girls and women from then on. He told Alme that if they didn't back off, Marcus would ask God to remove the offending entity. And then he told him, get a life, find your own women as God has commanded. Cause he literally just wanted to control all the women. But as the head of the household and the king of this incest, Marcus, of course, ate better than everybody else. He would eat fast food, cookies, and other junk food. And I mean, he's a pretty thick individual. The kids, on the other hand, would have to rummage through dumpsters looking for scraps. And at some point, he even put the family on a sugar-free diet and only let them eat pinto beans, stale bread, and vegetables and fruit found in the trash. 
Some of his kids remember Marcus always having money. Others remember long days searching for aluminum cans on the beach to trade in for some change because Marcus took everything from them. He took all the food. He took all the money from them, even though the kids are literally making it and gave it to him. He's literally this dictator, this king that is using and abusing his family for his own gain. Uh huh. I mean, it doesn't get much more fucked up than that. But the family did seem to have at least a few good times. When they traveled, Marcus played mixtapes of electronic music, rock hits, and Latin music as well. In December, they celebrated the 12 days of Christmas with special food where they actually got to eat spaghetti, lobster, and gingerbread cookies. Sometimes they even spent Saturdays in Woodward Park in Fresno, and the boys got to ride homemade skateboards while the girls got to play in the water. Marcus did teach them how to fish, swim, build things like small boats, and they did other wood projects together. They had also put on amateur plays, concerts, and ugly contests where the kids dressed up in old clothes to see who could look the worst. And they also kept a connection to the Seventh-day Adventist church, although there's no records that Marcus was a member. But some of the women were members, and the family sometimes went to 10-day spiritual retreats hosted by a church in California. Marcus also worked as a janitor on the SoQual campgrounds on and off through the 1980s and 1990s. But the family was always moving around and living in odd places because you have to. If you're, if you're living a life like that, you have to. Otherwise, if you stay somewhere too long, somebody's going to notice something. Something's very out of whack with this family. The children are, exactly. are, are looking wild. I mean, there's just so much weird dynamics uh-huh. going on here that this would have all ended exactly. much earlier if he had stayed in one place. And they, he knew that. They had to stay off the radar, essentially. Right, right. Because, I mean, I'm sure they rose suspicion with people and they see all these people together and, like, clearly they look like him to some extent or maybe not. But mm-hmm. And I can only imagine people could pick up on the children's energy, his energy, something's off. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they were super weird. Uh-huh. Because, I mean, if you're keeping people in isolation like that and they don't have normal interactions with the public, I mean, you're going to start to... To definitely have a different vibe about you. Like you're gonna set people, you know, normal people, I guess you could say is radar off. They're gonna be like, eh, something's off about this family. Yeah. I mean, you could just tell. And Marcus himself, I mean, he kind of stood out, I guess, if he went out in public. I mean, he's a big guy, 300 plus pounds, and he had long ass dreadlocks that would even go past his waist. And so people, you know, would judge him, obviously. I mean, sure. people always judge those with dreadlocks, but for him, I mean, big guy like that, he's oh, got yeah. dreadlocks, pat, you know, to his <laughs> ankles. I mean, people are going to kind of like hmm, raise an eyebrow at you. Oh, yeah. Like, all right, what's this dude's deal? And have you seen the face of this guy? This guy looks intimidating. Like, yeah, yeah, he definitely. He's he, got this mean mug. He of, does. He doesn't seem like somebody you'd want to fuck with. Not at all. And so because of this and the way he kind of looked and carried himself, most people were afraid of him. And they would just avoid his his little entourage altogether. But when he did talk to anyone, he would tell them stories about working as a corporate executive, a bank teller, or a junk dealer, which is just really bizarre. What? Corporate executive. Who's going to be like, you were a fucking corporate executive? Yeah, what? I was a CEO. Like, what, <laughs> dude? Are you serious? Looking like that? Right. In 1981, Marcus claimed a school bus as their home on welfare paperwork. The family traveled in this school bus quite often as it was their only home. But that same year, he got a $60,000 loan to build a home in Santa Cruz County. And the structure was 1,700 square foot. And the family lived there for the next three years. 1,700 square foot for that many kids, that large of a family, that's a pretty pretty tight living situation. I mean, 10 plus people in a 1,700 square foot. Oh, yeah, I can see that. I mean, shit. You're, I mean... My, my apartment is only like 1200 so so a little bit bigger than that maybe yeah i mean that's pretty crowded definitely definitely not ideal living conditions for all that people that many people no definitely not in september 1984 he started renting a dock at the harbor and the family started staying on a boat actually and the nearby convenience store owner would see the girls and young women who lived on the boat and they became concerned about them as it didn't seem like they had friends or ever went to school and it was very clear that Marcus 
was very controlling. If they walked away from him while he was still talking to them, Marcus would grab them by the hair and pull them violently back toward him. The girls also wore long sleeves, ankle length skirts or robes and headscarves, and they walked in a line behind Marcus with their heads bowed. How weird is that? How how bizarre of a sight would that be if you saw Marcus? Dude, I was going to say walking down the street and there's these girls following behind him dressed like this in a single heads file bowed. line, heads bowed. All right, that's clearly like asking for attention. You know, yeah, that mean? would raise some suspicion yeah. for sure. What the fuck? And one time when Marcus's daughter Sabrina came into the convenience store, the owner thought she was pregnant, which probably definitely concerned him. But while they lived at the docks, Marcus met a young man named Steve Sobrato, and he was a student at Stanford University working as a lifeguard on the weekends. Marcus told Steve that he had given up his corporate job as this executive to raise his family, and he was charming. And the kids were quiet and polite. Sometimes when Steve stayed the night on the family's boat, in the morning, he would have to help them get water out of the boat. <laughs> because this was a 26-foot sailboat that was clearly old. Yeah. and he, Had a few leaks. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> that he bought in 1987. And he bought it from a man named Kenneth Nelson. And when he bought it, he actually told Kenneth the boat was for him, his wife, and nine children to live on. And he paid $14,000 for it using traveler's checks and money orders. And this purchase got him in trouble, actually, with the welfare department. And Marcus actually called the office multiple times saying he was the actor Richard Widmark and told them Marcus Wesson didn't own the boat. Meanwhile, he told his welfare caseworker he needed the boat so his family could use the bathrooms and shower at the harbor, which when they checked with the harbor master, they thought this was absolutely ridiculous that this whole family stayed on this tiny sailboat together. Imagine these poor kids' lives, man. I mean, this is just like absolute hell that oh, you're yeah. living on. I can't even imagine nine kids on a tiny sailboat together. That's like torture. With Marcus? Yeah. Jesus. And what's there to do on a tiny sailboat? I mean, these kids gotta be bored out of their minds, man. Like and terrified and terrified on top of that. Yeah. How trapped and hopeless you'd feel. It'd be hard to even like want to live, honestly. Yeah. Harbor officials ended up passing a law limiting how many people could live on a boat. And Marcus believed the Harbor officials and the welfare department were of course working together in a conspiracy against him. So he wrote a letter to the court addressed to servant of the law. And he said, a man is within the jurisdiction of equity, ethics, and legality when he takes advantage of loopholes in the law for the betterment of his family. In 1989, Marcus was charged with perjury and welfare fraud, and officials claimed he had been overpaid by more than $20,000 in welfare benefits and food stamps because he hadn't claimed the boat as an asset. But Marcus never stopped working and trying to manipulate the system. He tried to claim the boat had been the family's primary residence to avoid the charges, but it didn't work. He then wrote a rambling 80-page letter to the judge saying that he was investigating the IRS and that it wasn't the IRS investigating him. During this whole ordeal, Marcus was represented by a public defender who he soon fired, and then he then filed a series of motions on his own behalf, which the judge looked at and was like, this is fucking gibberish. And as a result of this whole fraud scheme he was running, Marcus was convicted and sentenced to 180 days in jail, five years probation, and had to pay multiple fines. He ended up spending about three months in jail, was ordered to sell the boat, and get a job to pay the overdue harbor bills. And Elizabeth apparently knew he was in jail, but she thought he served time for contempt of court. She had no idea still about this welfare fraud situation. Marcus had a rent-to-own deal for a quarter-acre campsite in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the owner of the land was a computer programmer for IBM named A.J. Wheeler. So the family literally stayed at this campsite on and off for 12 years camping. Imagine camping for 12 years. That's so long. Literally in an army tent, <laughs> no running water, and a makeshift bathroom with a toilet and a shower. That's as shitty as it gets. Seriously. For 12 years? That's your life? I mean... It's gotta be so all hard these, as a kid growing yeah. up in that situation. 
absolutely insane. And he took his family there to get away from the neighbors and police whenever he felt threatened. And after AJ Wheeler died, his son Alex inherited the land somehow. And Alex contacted Marcus in 1997 to talk about the deal he had with his father. And this campsite was covered in old junk. Scrap metal, appliances, pipes, stoves, and other stainless steel items were littered all over. And Alex could never get a straight answer from Marcus about the deal or what he used the land for. And in 1999, he asked him to clear the old junk from the campsite. And when he did, Marcus was friendly and articulate. But again, he never gave a straight answer. And the land never got cleared. Over the holidays and for several weeks over the summer, the family sometimes stayed with Elizabeth's mother in a dilapidated duplex on the southern edge of Fresno's Tower District. In 1999, Marcus left a note for a lawyer named Frank Muna, wanting to buy a two-story tutor near Fresno City College that had been badly damaged in a fire. And at first, Marcus said he wasn't related to the buyers, but later he said he was an uncle. The buyers were really his daughters, Kiani and Sabrina, and his nieces, Sophina and Ruby. And so they ended up buying the home in 2000. And in 2001, Frank Muna filed a lawsuit against the three women for failing to pay him the full agreed upon amount. He also doubted Marcus's story that he was an uncle after seeing him around the two of the women. One of them had her hand in his back pocket and he kissed the other on the lips, literally experiencing the incest firsthand. I'm sure he was just like, this is just such a fucked up situation. Like, what is going on here? He's like having his, his daughters do his dirty work for him. Meanwhile, he's molesting them pretty much. What was also crazy is at this particular property, Frank Muna actually saw two coffins there. One of the coffins was made up like a bed, and the other coffin looked like it was used as a crib. Marcus had actually bought 10 mahogany caskets from an antique dealer in Fresno. He paid $400 to $500 for each of them. He told the dealer of this antique store that he planned to use the wood from the coffins on his boat, but it took him almost a year to come back and pick them up. When he finally came back, the dealer watched curiously as several young women loaded these caskets into a school bus. What the heck? What? How fucking weird is that? Like, how confused you'd be like, uh, what yeah. is this guy doing? I'd be so confused. City inspectors checked out the Tudor house and the surrounding property, and they saw a school bus and a utility trailer in the driveway. So the city started issuing citations for illegal storage of these vehicles in July 2003. Soon after, Marcus sold the house, and the legal problems disappeared along with it. Marcus was absolutely fascinated by David Koresh, like we said, and seemed to model his family after the famous cult leader. When this all happened, if you know anything about David Koresh and the incident at Waco in 1993, where 79 of his followers died during a raid by the FBI, during this whole ordeal, Marcus would actually gather his family around the TV to watch. And he's, he, really, he really thought David Crush was like doing it right, was living, li living life like he wanted to live. And while they were watching this whole siege going down, Marcus was telling his family that this is how the world is attacking God's people. This man is just like me. He is making children for the Lord, and that's what we should be doing, making children for the Lord. So after this whole incident at Waco went down, he renewed his focus on having as many children as possible with his daughters and nieces so that he would be given a greater eternal reward by God. And to make sure the government could never take his children away from him, he set up a suicide pact. If anyone ever tried to split up the family, the mothers would each kill their own children and then themselves. Marcus told his niece Rosa and his daughter Sabrina they were strong soldiers. That's real, real nice. It was their job to make sure every family member was killed if anyone tried to separate them. He also told them to hunt down and kill any family members who betrayed him. He would ask them, more often than not, if the time comes, are you ready? Marcus even started holding monthly family meetings to go over this plan and make sure everyone knew their place. In September of 2003, the family moved to 761 Hammond Avenue in Fresno, California. And this was a thousand square foot, one story structure about a mile away from Roding Park. It was actually originally an office building. His niece Rosa ended up buying it for $100,000, again, making his niece buy it for him 
so he's not attached to it. Marcus's other nieces, Ruby and Safina, had left the family at that point, and they wanted to bring their sons, Jonathan and Aviv, with them. But Marcus refused to let them take the kids until they were older, at least seven or eight years old. The women agreed and took off. Knowing the boys didn't get nearly as much abuse as the girls, they thought the boys would be safe with Marcus for a little while until they could come back and get them. So Marcus moved the family into this Fresno makeshift home, parked his renovated school bus next to it. What a fucking bizarre. Can you imagine <laughs> being their neighbors, dude, and this guy's like, you see a fucking school, school bus? bus. He's got all these kids that are like kissing on him. And so it's uh-huh. like, what the hell's going on here? And neighbors would like not only see what he was doing, but they would hear him working on his school bus at all times of the night. Some people even believed he installed a hot tub in his school bus. Ugh. What the hell? And people who saw the women walking around the property saw them wearing long black dresses and they never talked to anyone. They wouldn't even look up at the neighbors, let alone wave or say hello. They were just completely obedient to Marcus. Top of all that weird activity, there was always strange, foul odors coming from the home that the neighbors thought was something nasty the family was cooking. But for whatever reason, despite the the fact that the neighbors were talking about Marcus and situation to each other, they never reported anything. Biggest mistake right there. Unbelievable. How could you not report this guy? At least for a noise complaint, he's out there banging on a school bus at night. Like seriously, I come mean, on. It just—if this doesn't teach you anything, it should teach you that if you see something weird, mm-hmm. say something about it. Definitely, I, I've done this in my life. I've seen sketchy shit going on in my neighborhood that I—I I was like, eh, questionable about what they're doing. Sure, could they be doing something legal? Yes. Do I know for sure? No. But you know what? You can always have the police go check it out. They will always go check it out at least. You know, and if, yeah. if they're not doing anything wrong, then whatever. I they go about their business. Exactly. At least you had it checked out. Right. And the fact that the neighbors never did this with Marcus or never, I just can't believe it because oh, wow. they might have been able to shut this down a long oh, time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot earlier than it did. It's also interesting, too, that people that have reported having encounters with Marcus Wesson throughout the years, always reported that the dude just stank. He was nasty. Just not, I mean, honestly, it could have just been Marcus. that was stinking up the whole block. I mean, you think Pazuzu Algarod stinky bad? Yes, <laughs> definitely. I mean, they're camping for 12 years. They're uh, living out of a school bus. They have, they're living out of a makeshift like house out of an old office building. I mean, mm. they never clearly, they never had access to sure. like, but, showers and but stuff. remember pazuzu did shit on the floor that's true <laughs> pazuzu probably still holds the record for nastiest Stinkiest, motherfucker nastiest, yeah. yeah yeah but yeah, still dead, that's dead shit everywhere yeah, yeah still but that's still. bad yeah Ugh. and again there's fucking children in this situation too mm-hmm. they're living in this filth but officials claim the family was violating the city code as this building was still zoned for commercial use and the school bus was allowed to be parked in a residential area So city inspectors came by and issued a citation and ordered the family to either leave or get a special permit to live on the property. And their deadline was March 12th, 2004. At this point, things really start to go downhill. But before we get into that, I want to quickly thank our sponsors today. Many of you have mentioned that for some reason, you're able to fall asleep listening to this show which I don't understand. I guess my voice is soothing, right? Yep. Well, I'm here to tell you about Purple today. If you throw some bedding on a bunch of different mattresses, sure, they'll all look the same. The same goes for pillows. But peel away the layers and take a look at what's inside, and you'll see that all mattresses and pillows are not created equal. And that's what makes every Purple pillow and mattress unlike anything you've ever slept on. Purple has something called the Purple Grid, and this is what sets them apart from every other mattress out there. It's their own patented comfort technology that instantly adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. 
And this cutting edge technology doesn't stop with their mattresses. Every purple pillow is engineered with the grid for total head and neck support with absolute airflow. So you'll always be on the cool side of the pillow. I actually have one of these purple pillows. I sleep with it every night. I'm a side sleeper and this purple pillow is my side sleeping pillow because it does literally conform to my arm, to my side of my body. And best of all, it stays cool because nothing is worse than a hot pillow. You can actually try every purple product risk-free with free shipping and returns. And purple is financing available as low as 0% APR for qualified customers. So experience the purple grid and you'll sleep like never before. Go to purple.com slash lights out 10 and use promo code lights out 10. And for a limited time, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash lights out 10. Use promo code lights out 10 for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Terms do apply. Our next sponsor is Babbel. I actually love Babbel a lot because one of the things in school that I did not take seriously was Spanish. And I wish I would have because Spanish is such a valuable language to know. And so I was very excited that Babbel came along and said, hey, we want to sponsor you. So I've been learning a little bit of Spanish with Babbel. I know how to say, my name is Josh. <laughs> Hola. Me amo es Josue. Si, sí, me amo Joel. There you go. My name is Josh. My name is Joel. Babbel is really cool. It's the number one selling language learning app for a reason. And I can see why. I'm very excited because Babbel makes learning a language super easy. They break it down into 15 minute lessons. So it's like little chunks at a time. I mean, le learning a language is a big, big thing to take on. But with Babbel, you can really break it down and chip away at it a little bit each day. And I mean, they have all types of languages as well. Spanish is just the one that I chose because I feel like it's probably one of the most useful languages out there. There's tons of Spanish speakers just here in America and where I live, you know, in lots of places that I visit on, on the daily, but they also have Chinese, they have German, they've got Japanese, they've got pretty much any of the major languages out there, Russian. So if you've ever thought, Hey, I would love to learn how to speak another language. Well, Babbel has got you covered. So what are you waiting for? Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. And right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. So that's six months for the price of just three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Code LIGHTSOUT for an extra three months free. Babbel is language for life. And finally, our last sponsor for today is Bartleby Learn. Bartleby Learn helps you get homework done fast and done right. And it's just an easier way to study hard. With Bartleby Learn, you get homework help in more than 30 subjects, including business, science, math, and engineering. Plus, they give you step-by-step -step solutions to millions of textbook problems. And there's always subject matter experts on standby when students are stuck, who will usually answer you in as fast as 30 minutes. Plus, they have a searchable database of solutions to homework questions asked by other students. So with our special offer, you can actually ask 10 homework questions for free, which is super useful. I mean, honestly, if I was still in school, I would 100% be checking out Bartleby because who doesn't want homework help? I mean, who doesn't want to get that shit done way faster? So right now, if you go to getbartleby.com slash lights out, you'll get 10 free homework questions answered. Again, that's G-E-T-B-A-R-T-L-E-B-Y dot com slash lights out for 10 free homework questions. Again, 10 free homework questions expire 30 days after redeeming this offer and response times do vary by subject and question complexity, but the median response time is 34 minutes and may be longer for new subjects. And this offer is only valid through December 31st, 2021. So get those 10 free homework questions today. Get Bartleby.com slash lights out. All right, let's get back to the story of Marcus Wesson. So at this time, Ruby and Safina, who were his nieces, had left again. And they were working on a plan 
to come back and rescue their two sons, Jonathan and Aviv, who are now seven years old. Mark has again told them that he would let them go when they were seven or eight years old. So on March 12th, 2004, Ruby and Safina gathered several family members and went to this Fresno house to get their boys back. And they had heard rumors that Marcus was planning to take the family to Washington State where his parents lived. Plus, they knew all about the family's suicide pact and what might happen if the city tried to take the kids. So they knew that time was of the essence and they had to get there fast. But when they got there, a fight broke out. While Marcus stayed calm, the other women came out screaming at Ruby and Safina, and they called them Judas, Lucifer, whores, and bitches, and they said, bow down to your master. So this whole scene just breaks out. I mean, there's a whole domestic disturbance happening. People are yelling and screaming, yelling these obscenities at each other. And next thing you know it, neighbors call the Fresno police. Officers responded to a report of a domestic dispute over child custody. That was the official call that went out. And they arrived on scene around 2.30 p.m. When they knocked on the door, Marcus answered. And he was completely calm and polite with officers. Meanwhile, Ruby and Safina are screaming, panicking, demanding that Marcus send out their sons, Aviv and Jonathan. Marcus agreed to let the officers take the boys, but he said he wanted to let them pack their things up first and say goodbye. So he then went back inside and closed the door, locking it behind him. Inside the house, Marcus quietly rounded everyone up and led them to the back bedroom. His wife Elizabeth was still inside with their oldest daughter, Kiani, their 25-year-old daughter, Sabrina, and their 17-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. Kiani had her two kids, 8-year-old Isabel and 13-month-old Jeva and Sabrina had her son, 18 month old Marshy. Marcus's niece, Rosa, was inside with her four year old son, Ethan, and one year old daughter, Sedona. Aviv and Jonathan, whose mothers were just outside, were also led into the bedroom. Elizabeth, Kiani, and Rosa, however, did not enter the bedroom. The only adult who went in, other than Marcus, was Sabrina. Outside of the house, Ruby and Safina told officers about the suicide pact and said Marcus was going to hurt the children. But the officers at this point didn't think they had enough reason to believe this and to break into the house. They didn't think that something bad was going to happen, I guess. I mean, clearly they didn't believe these women. The officers even called the city attorney, but were told that they had no legal right to enter. Meanwhile, Marcus's niece Rose and his wife Elizabeth ran out of the house, leaving their children in the back bedroom with Marcus. And at this point, they told the police that Marcus had a gun. One of Marcus's sons confirmed that his father owned a gun and kept it in the house. Kiani stayed in the house while Marcus and Sabrina had all the children in the back bedroom, including her kids. At this point, they believe they have a barricaded situation where he's, or a hostage situation, really. Marcus has got a gun. He's holding them hostage in this bedroom. So instead of the police entering at that point, they call for backup. And that's when the SWAT team arrived and started taking positions around the house. And obviously, you bring the SWAT team into the neighborhood, this is going to obviously have everybody in the, in the neighborhood wondering what's going on. Oh, yeah. Because most of the time, they'll bring the, the chopper gunner or, or the helicopter. You know? Yeah, I mean, they're bringing, they're bringing the big guns in mm-hmm. at this point. So all the neighbors are gathered around the house watching to see what happens next and that's when they heard gunshots and a woman screaming but none of the officers on the scene said they reported hearing gunshots so they didn't break into the house but then literally moments later 57 year old marcus wesson walked calmly out of the house covered in blood and surrendered to police which i'm just like what how does this even make sense how does everybody else hear gunshots and the police doesn't hear gunshots? Yeah. This doesn't make any sense at all. And Marcus is covered in blood. How do they not? Like, there's children in there. The guy's got a gun. Why would it? I just don't understand why they didn't do anything. They could have done something to get Marcus away from the children or... Or try to, like, talk to him. Like, they didn't yeah. do anything. They just posted up outside. Oh, man. 
one of those situations where it could have been handled differently on the yeah. law enforcement side. Just the response was clearly not the right move. At that point, Marcus was arrested on suspicion of homicide, and he was such a big guy that they had to put three sets of handcuffs on him even just to get him handcuffed. But he was completely calm, completely cooperative, never fought back. And they set his bail at $9 million. Officer Escarino was a seasoned officer and former army medic and a hospital nurse. And he was one of the first officers to actually go inside the home. However, the second he walked into the house, he immediately broke down into tears. As he was completely overwhelmed by the tragedy and the horror of this scene that he walked in on. When he made his way into that back bedroom, all seven children who had been inside the house were dead, along with Marcus's daughter, Sabrina. And he had piled all the bodies, like wood, into a stack, and Sabrina was lying on top, and each of them had been shot point blank through the eye. And as you can imagine, I mean, this was an extremely gruesome scene. There's just blood everywhere. The limbs of their bodies are all twisted up with clothes. So at first, it was impossible to even know how many bodies there were. Elizabeth Wesson tried to fight through the police to get inside the house, but they would not let her enter. Other relatives gathered outside, screamed and collapsed in grief. And they started blaming the police immediately for this horrible tragedy and for not breaking into the house and stopping Marcus. Once they realized that this was a crime scene at this point, they had to wait several hours for search warrants to be issued in order for them to actually search the house, the school bus, and the rest of the property. A square quarter mile around the house was locked down until about 6.30 p.m., and after that, the 200 feet around the house were taped off as a crowd gathered. It was after 9 p.m. before investigators could start the search and collect evidence. At about 10.30 p.m., the coroner started removing bodies in white body bags. Some were so tiny, officials cradled them in their arms, and it took over three hours to remove them all. Just before 11.30 p.m., Mayor Alan Autry arrived on the scene to talk to reporters. He said they had the perpetrator in custody, and all they could do now was mourn. Investigators worked throughout the night processing the crime scene and gathering evidence. Police Chief Jerry Dyer started putting the pieces together. He realized there was polygamy, incest, and ritualistic killings, and he began to suspect Marcus Wesson was a leader of a cult, clearly. The police chief actually went on the Today Show that morning at 4.30 to talk about the case, and it was a hard decision to make. Word of the murders was spreading quickly in the media, and he wanted to make sure everyone knew this tragedy was not normal in Fresno. That night, six police chaplains were called to the scene to comfort officers as they collected evidence. So I was like, what the hell? They could have literally prevented this. Early the next day, investigators were seen removing 10 caskets from the front room of the house. They were actually lining the walls and stacked on top of one another. And they were larger than standard caskets and made of hand-carved mahogany wood. After processing this horrific crime scene, several officers had to take leaves of absence and many had to consult therapists. Investigators started questioning the surviving family members. Two of his sons actually said Marcus was a good dad and that he wasn't a cult leader and that they were just raised as Seventh-day Adventists. But as soon as that was said, the church was quick to disassociate from this whole thing, even releasing a statement that said Marcus had never been a member, although his parents and a few relatives were. His youngest son, Serafino, said his seeing his father in handcuffs broke his heart and he called him a mighty lion and a king. A man named Mike said he was Marcus's brother-in-law, and he told investigators that he thought he was God, and that's how he ruled his family. His daughter Kiani, who was inside the house when the murders took place, and his niece Rosa refused to say they had been raped by Marcus. Kiani said whatever happened in the home was by agreement and talk. It was totally by choice. We had a democratic family. And Rosa said there was never any rape, nothing forcible. They also told investigators that Ruby and Safina had come for their sons and had agreed to be surrogates for Marcus and had no right to take the boys. So what a confusing situation this is. I mean, just to try to figure out who's lying, who's telling the truth. I mean, they, the detectives were like, what is this fucking family? This is just so bizarre. 
So they tried piecing together all the information they had from all the family members. But they realized that Marcus had fathered up to 18 children with seven women, which many of these women were actually his daughters and nieces. And they ended up using DNA to identify all of the nine victims. And what they found is that all of them were fathered by Marcus. The nine victims included Sabrina, who was the 25-year-old daughter of Marcus and daughter of Elizabeth, his wife. Marshy, the 18-month-old son of Sabrina, who was the grandson of Marcus's. Elizabeth, who was the 17-year-old daughter of Marcus and his wife, Elizabeth. Eight-year-old Illabel and 13-month-old Jeva. Children of Kiani and children and grandchildren of Marcus. Four-year-old Ethan and one-year-old Sedona, who were children of Rosa, were also children of Marcus, and a nephew and niece of Marcus. Seven-year-old Aviv, the son of Ruby, who was also son of Marcus, and nephew of Marcus. Seven-year-old Jonathan, who was son of Safina, as well as Marcus, and a nephew. It was just a completely incestual, just fucked up family. All nine of these victims were literally his kids and incestually his kids. I mean, they were literally his nephews and nieces that were also his kids. I mean, it's just a confusing, horrible, tragic situation. And when the coroner did autopsies, it determined that none of the victims had struggled as all of them were killed by the gunshot wound to the head. After this, the community and Fresno was just completely rocked by this horrible tragic event that went down but the community came together for their surviving family members offering support and donations and they put up a large memorial outside the house a local tv reporter named alicia sofios actually personally got involved in the case elizabeth marcus's wife and his daughters gypsy and kiani had nowhere to go after this and no money and so she invited them to move in with her and she ended up staying roommates with gypsy for several years after this horrible day she also met with Marcus's adult sons who were still determined to clear their dad's name. Alicia viewed them like cult members who needed to be deprogrammed. But she was criticized for getting so involved in the case, but came to be viewed as a family member. And she actually ended up publishing a book called Where Hope Begins, One Family's Journey Out of Tragedy, and the reporter who helped them make it. And clearly this reporter had such an impact on the family and Gypsy especially that when she had another daughter, she actually named her after this reporter. Meanwhile, when the police questioned Marcus, he claimed he didn't kill anyone. His 25-year-old daughter, Sabrina, had killed all the children and then shot herself. The murder weapon was a stainless steel Ruger MK2 Target 22 caliber handgun. There was also no fingerprints found on the gun, but they did find Sabrina's DNA on it. There was also no gunshot residue on Sabrina's or Marcus's hands. However, it was found underneath her body, along with a hunting knife. The bullet had entered Sabrina's eye in an upward trajectory, and she was lying on top of the other bodies, both indicating it could have been suicide. So it may have been possible that Marcus literally ordered her to execute the suicide pact, which is crazy. It's like he set this all up. He literally set it up so that he hopefully would get off scot-free. Be like, oh, Sabrina killed him. I had nothing to do with it. Unless he was wearing like some gloves or a long sleeve or something for that gun gunshot residue not to get on him like that. But it does yeah. seem like he did order and it hurt it. Seems it. like based on the evidence that Sabrina did in fact shoot herself. So if she shot herself, then it's it's also possible that she shot the rest of the, uh-huh. the kids as well. Yeah. So obviously Marcus is under suspicion for homicide, but you know, and he thinks, Oh, I'm good there. But he's forgetting that there's all these other counts against him as well. On top of the nine counts of murder, he had 13 sex counts as well, including rape and molestation of girls younger than 14. He ended up delaying his arraignment by refusing to accept a public defender as he wanted to hire his own lawyers, but it was unclear if he had any money to pay for them. So he ended up being represented by public defenders Peter Jones and Ralph Torres. And this guy fucking pled not guilty at his preliminary hearing. While in jail, though, Marcus was on suicide watch because of his family's suicide pact. He was watched 24 hours a day and had no contact with any members of his family. 
Many potential jurors for the case had to be excused because they were so terrified of Marcus that they didn't even want to be in the same room with him. His trial, though, started in spring of 2005, and by that time, Marcus had lost almost half his weight, and his dreadlocks were cut short. The defense argued that his daughter Sabrina was a killer, and that she shot all eight victims, including her 18-month-old son, and then turned the gun on herself. The prosecution, however, argued that Marcus was the shooter, and that he should receive the death penalty for his crimes. Even if Sabrina pulled the trigger, she did it because of him and that he should still receive the death penalty under conspiracy to commit murder. Several witnesses testified about the family suicide pact. One of Elizabeth and Marcus's sons testified that if his mother didn't know what was going on, she would have had to been pretty dumb. Other kids testified that Marcus was a good father and talked about happy times in their childhood. So it seemed like there is a split narrative. Either Marcus was a loving husband and father who treated his family well, or he was this incestuous predatory monster who made life a living hell for his family. And which version of Marcus was described dependent on who you were talking to in the family. Some of the kids were asked to read diary entries out loud for the court and seemed embarrassed or ashamed to talk about any unhappy times. It was like they were betraying their father. Ruby and Safina, who had gone to the house to rescue their sons, both testified and talked about Marcus's total control over every family member. They also talked about how the suicide pact and how they warned the officers on the scene that this was in place and that he would hurt their kids. Kiani, who had lost two of her children the day of the murders, testified that if her daughter hadn't died that day, she would have wanted a different life for her than she had. She refused to explicitly say she didn't want her daughter to have to marry her father as she had. She would only say through tears that she wanted a different life for her. So still controlled. But after all the witnesses were allowed to make their statements, the jury ended up deliberating on this case for two weeks. And on June 17, 2005, Marcus Wesson was found guilty of nine counts of first-degree murder, 14 counts of raping and molesting seven of his underage daughters and nieces, and the jury determined that Marcus may not have fired the gun, but he was still guilty of the murders because he convinced his children to enter the suicide pact, which I honestly 100% agree with. I think he should have absolutely been guilty of all of these crimes. And as a result, he was sentenced to 102 years for the rape and molestation charges, and he received the death penalty for the nine murders. Marcus Weston should have been executed by now. However, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a new bill that changes the death penalty in 2019. So basically, Marcus Weston will never be executed as it was originally planned, and he will live out the rest of his days in prison on death row in San Quentin. And that's just so frustrating to hear because I've seen a lot of lockup and lockdown like prison documentaries with death row. And believe it or not, inmates who are on death row do get treated better than inmates who are in general population yeah. and solitary confinement. Because there's that there this whole mindset that you're going to be executed, yeah. so we'll give they you have a bit. certain luxuries a lot of the other inmate population don't have. So the fact that he's going to yeah. remain on death row, he he's technically living better than any other inmate yeah. there. How crazy is that? Just pisses me Especially off. Especially at San Quentin. Yeah. Because if you know what goes on oh, in San Quentin, General Pop You don't want to be in General Pop at San Quentin. That's just floor after floor after floor yeah. of just bars and bars animal and bars, cages, animal cages. Yeah. Treat like an animal versus if you're on death row, mm -hmm. you're going to get better treatment, probably exactly. better food, better accommodations. Right. So this monster is literally living uh, out the rest of his life in the best way possible. Uh, makes me so Quinn. mad. Yeah. And he's 74 years old now. And we, it, what's crazy, we still don't even know the true motive behind you know, really his beliefs in the suicide pact. Like, what was that even about? Like, if you want to know what I think, I think the reason why he murdered them was because he knew that they, they would be, I, I think he set this whole thing up. I don't mm. even think he truly believed all these things. I think he used it as a tool to manipulate and control. Yeah, definitely. In order to get what he wanted. And clearly He's a pedophile. Yeah. Clearly he was fulfilling sexual fantasies that are disgusting, sick and disturbing that he's thought about his entire life. 
and he used religion and you know i'm the vampire king in order to control yeah those around him and once he realized he could do that he got to live exactly the life he wanted to live mm-hmm. and and i think that the, was the motive yeah and i think the suicide pact uh part of that could be he he knew all those terrible things he did to his children and his family that if before he gets caught the more he can eliminate of the mess he's made maybe the better it'd go for him in trial i don't know if that's what he was thinking but i mean it would make sense because if all those children were still alive today then they would have all testified against him i would that's, think that's what i think it is, would have changed the whole he probably would have been put to death immediately or something you know well i mean as we both know like it takes a long time for execution especially in california years I mean, I mean years they haven't had a execution for a long time in california so really he kind of got off in a way you know like he did he really did he like did. he's not he's not facing the punishment that not he at should all. no for all the i mean he literally stole the lives of yeah. you know not only did he murder nine people but he also stole the lives of steal. everyone in his family because now they don't have their kids they don't have their loved ones and and now he's just kind of living out the rest of his days right and what's crazy is that there's many surviving family members that are actually still supporting him even after this guilty verdict which is crazy that's so crazy i mean he literally it's it's just wild that he he literally got away with you know not taking responsibility for the murders even though they charged him with the murders you know they he he was kind of smart in the sense that he pawned that off on sabrina and made her do his dirty work for him because he he set this up the whole time he did he knew like you said that they would come out and say all this shit about him and he would it, he may have gone down harder harder somehow if they were alive mm-hmm. and got to tell their stories and stuff later on and so he said you know what i'll make a suicide pact and because i got everybody brainwashed they'll follow what i say and, and kill them for me and it seems the brainwashing is so strong that family members can still speak like good things about him or, yeah, or something yeah. i don't understand clearly that. yeah clearly he really did have everybody brainwashed uh-huh and believing in this twisted weird perverted version of christianity that he was preaching to everybody yeah. i mean it's just a yeah. it's a classic case of somebody who is a psychopath who is fucking only living their life for themselves doesn't care about anybody else but himself and he's willing to expend the lives of his own family his own flesh and blood in yeah. order to give himself the pleasure the life the lifestyle that he wanted all along he used everybody he did and there's still people being used by him to this day it's absolutely insane Mm -hmm. i mean and luckily a lot of them have you know been able to kind of undo the the programming that he did and been able to kind of go on to to live their lives and all but i don't even know how you do that after all this how do you go on like how do you knowing that your family was literally massacred and what's crazy is that this is the still to this day this is the most deadly mass murder in fresno history oh wow i didn't is know of the that. wesson family wow nine people that's a lot absolutely insane so that is the absolutely disturbing story of marcus wesson the vampire king can't believe that he's even still alive yeah me neither but hopefully hopefully he won't be on this earth for much longer because i can't even imagine those affected by him and the fact they have to think about the fact he's still alive and he's still still, breathing the same air yeah you know no remorse no no sorry Mm -mm. nothing thinks he's he's probably still thinks he's god still thinks he's jesus i can see that just a yeah just an individual that should not be here Mm -mm. but with that we'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there hopefully this was as interesting to you as it was to us i mean this was this is a wild wild story definitely marcus wesson man thanks again for joining us for another episode of the lights out podcast we will see you guys next time but until then lights out everybody